My name's Anne Evans. I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Arts and Social Sciences. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on whose lands that we are meeting today, um, the land of the Ngunnawal people. I acknowledge their elders uh, past and present. Um, I acknowledge particularly their contribution to um, the City of Canberra and to the Australian National University and I welcome any Indigenous people who happen to be with us today. So the inaugural professorial lecture series is run by CAS to welcome new professorial staff um, into our college. Today we are welcoming Professor Diana Slade from the School of Literature, Linguistics and Languages. <laughs> um, Di joined CAS in February of this year. Uh, before coming to ANU, she was the Professor of, of Applied Linguistics and Director of the International Research Centre for Communication in Healthcare at the University of Technology in Sydney and at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. She has over 30 years of experience in researching, teaching and publishing in applied linguistics, linguistics and in organisational communication. There are currently two major strands to Dye's research, the analysis and description of spoken English and the application of these theoretical insights to the analysis of healthcare communication. And since 2011, she has particularly focused on the critical role of communication in the provision of safe and effective healthcare. And this is what Di is going to talk to us about today. So Thank welcome, Di. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne, for the lovely introduction. Oh dear, I haven't even given it yet. <laughs> you mightn't be clapping at the end. Um, okay, look, I'm sorry if you, when I talked at Conversations at Creek, I said a little bit about my background, because I don't think it really makes sense without it. So sorry if that's slightly repetitive for those who are there. But basically, I've been, um, my history is I'm a functional linguist, a sort of social functional linguist. And for many years, I've been researching the description and role of spoken language, both in casual community contexts, formal and informal, particularly casual, but also casual conversation, also um, the role and description of spoken language at work. So that's been my background. So for many years, my early PhD work, I was describing authentic casual conversations in English. So I collected over, well, with, with, with um, Suzanne Eggins, and I'll talk to you about her in a moment, we collected, and a few others, over a million, it's about 1.2 million words of actual, in, actual conversations, Australian, collected in the Australian context, many non-English speaking background. And we've established a database called OzTalk, which I'm really keen to move here to ANU, because I think it's a fantastic resource for students who want to look at conversation, because we all know how many hours it takes to collect authentic data. So, um, the, and so what I did is I collected conversations between um, men and women at the workplace, groups of all men and groups of all women. I also recorded my children, my daughters, for two years. And so I was looking at basically how is it that the way they talk obviously was a reflection and constructed their identities and social values. What's interesting is that because I only had girls, not boys, I asked a friend of mine, Penny Biggins, to take record her boys for two years, similar age, 11 and 12. The difference was so startling. Basically, the boys didn't talk. There was language as action. And, and Penny came when she came with recordings and said, I'm incredibly sorry, there's nothing on them. I mean, I'm, just, I'm about to put them in the bin. I said, no, 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 that's exactly what makes it interesting. Anyway, that's really when I started getting really fascinated about gender differences, particularly in casual talk. And I know a lot of people have been doing that. Now, what I'm interested in is the question, how is language structured to enable conversation to work? So how is language structured to enable conversation to work and have the power it does. So in other words, my concern was to describe, like many other linguists here, like Joanna, the dialectic between language and social and workplace context. So it's basically ways in which conversation socialises individuals and regulates the social order. I think all of us will agree, because many of us are linguists here, that basically it's in talk, in conversations, whether it's formal or informal, that participants enact and confirm their social identities and relations. So because of that, and also I'll just say first of all, sorry, it's the, it's the paradox of talk that the serious work that's going on is taken for granted. You don't realise it when you're doing it. And that's the various, the Berger and Luckman theory about why conversation has the power it does, because it's so spontaneous that you don't ever, very rarely do stand back and see the powerful social work it's doing. Now, because of that, also, if you believe in that, communication basically plays, a, and spoken language in particular, a vital role in workplaces. 
Okay, so so basically, what I started doing after doing all of my, my, my work on casual conversation for about ten years was I started collecting um, spoken language in workplaces and looking, and then followed by training. So I worked in um, for the National Food and Council with Uncle Toby's New South Wales State Rail Authority, much to my embarrassment now with Nestles. It's only been since then we found out you know, Nestles' reputation. I looked at spoken language of teamwork, training, etc. Okay, so, but then what I thought, when I stopped being doing my ministry of roles, like associate dean and things for years, I thought, okay, what will I do now? And I then decided to focus on health. Because obviously, health is a really critical area in terms of the impact you can make, if you can then translate the research to practice. And also strategically, it's, it's always been a government, well, at least the last 10 years, it's been a high government authority, I mean, a, a high government priority. Now, just before I start the presentation, I want to say that the I really um, um, Suzanne Ekins that unfortunately can't be here, but she, as she, as all of you would know, come to ANU. She has been a colleague of mine for 30 years. I'm completely indebted to her about the work. This is a completely collaborative work. We wrote a book called Analyzing Casual Conversation, just after we stopped um, being PhD students and submitted the PhD. She did it on dinner party with friends, and I looked at workplace conversations. So, um, but, and then I convinced her five years ago to come out of semi-retirement and work with me on healthcare. So this is a, a very much a joint paper. Okay, so the, the issue is then, why, why um, is, is healthcare important and why is it a fruitful context for linguists? Now once, a few people here in health would know this, but basically there's enough evidence now that's in irrefutable about the role of communication in effective healthcare. The, the analogy or the, the, the quality of that is that ineffective communication between clinicians and patients is a major cause of critical incidents. Okay, so about 80% of critical incidents are caused by communication breakdowns. It also, it also motivates the highest number of patient complaints. And so for example, if a, pa if a doctor is considered, or, an, or nurses get complained about much less often, but if a doctor is considered to be interpersonally really warm, compassionate, but medically have made an error, they very rarely get complained about. It's only if a doctor is inter considered to be interpersonally rude or, and, and, and also performed an error that they will get complained about, which once again shows the power of, of, of and the importance of communication. Okay, so the other issue is cost. It's, the average cost in Australia is two billion a year of avoidable patient harm, of which six hundred million is from communication breakdowns. The other thing is Peter Garling ran a, and did a, um, a special inquiry in New South Wales quite recently on hospitals. What he said was the, the patient clinic, clinician communication in New South Wales, which you can generalise across all parts of Australia was unacceptable in a civilised society, let alone a system of patient-centred healthcare. It's a pretty damning comment. However, even, even though people are aware of this, the patient complaints are increasing, and 10% of patients now are entering a hospital will suffer adverse events. I think most probably, if you came to my last talk, heard this figure. 500 people a year who got, are harmed by the hospitals they go to to help. 500,000 people, sorry, not 500, 500,000 people a year suffer an avoidable critical incident. So, which is pretty extraordinary when you look at the population of 24 million, the, the, what, what the chances are of suffering from something that you didn't go in there with, which is an avoidable critical incidence, of which over 80% they believe are attributed to poor communication. Okay, so um, what we then decide to do what we thought was there was a, there was a lack of evidence-based research in this area. So people, because what happens when there's been a communication problem is that that is mainly looked at by forensic inquiries, coronial inquiries, retrospectively, where you're relying on interviews, people's memory, but very, but very rarely, there's no research I know of, that basically, or well, there's a little bit of research, but really looks at what's going wrong in actual context of use by audio and video recording. So. Um, so what we did, so we, so ten years ago, we start the first project was communication in emergency departments. What I was looking at there was the patient's journey through the emergency department. So what we did is we recorded 82 patients through the emergency department, 
And now we've got the largest, what we think is the largest database in the world of clinician patient interactions in emergency departments. So the M um, is a very, very unusual one. So what we did then after the emergency department, because what we committed to is applying and translating, which I'll look at at the moment, the findings, the analysis, the findings of the research into developing training in hospital context. So that's what I did with Susie McQueen, a wonderful colleague. We did um, research at Melbourne University, it was UTS, a Melbourne University medical faculty, came together to apply the authentic database, look at the authentic data, and say how can we turn that into training for pre-service doctors in communication in emergency departments. So we did, and Susie really led that project. Okay, the other thing we've been doing is trying to apply this research in other contexts overseas. So in Hong Kong, where I was for four years, we replicated the study by looking at communication in emergency departments in Hong Kong. The extraordinary thing was despite the differences, there's enormous cultural differences and contextual differences, they're trilingual, they code switch from English to Cantonese to Mandarin, but even despite those differences, the similarities were extraordinary in terms of the causes of breakdown and the causes of complexity. What we did in this project, what was really interesting about this project is we had, um, with three of the patients we recorded, there was actual evidence in the, in the interactions with the doctors that because the doctor didn't listen and attend to the patient, the patient didn't comply with the treatment. So in other words, there was, one, there was a patient who was suffering from depression. The doctor kept misdiagnosing it as dizziness. And so the patient, and you could see in the interaction, the patient kept trying to return to, but my son has just tried to commit suicide. So, and these have been translated from Cantonese into English, so the team, the, so, and, and the doctor kept on not listening to that diagnosis. And the, doc, and the, and the patient actually turned to the researcher, and Crystal we called her, we, we used students, turned to the researcher and said, he didn't even listen to me, I'm not taking that medication, and left. So, um, so what's interesting about that data is not normally do you see, so I've got a funny story, a direct correlation between one consultation and patient health outcomes. Normally what it is, is an accumulation over time. That there's not a direct relationship between a communication breakdown and patient safety. But what, as you can imagine, what happens is one little thing goes wrong, then, so for example, a junior doctor will make a mistake, but then the senior doctor will come in and so it's like the layers of an onion ring, where you, but it is that multiplier effect. But however, in Hong Kong, we did see, what we realised during those projects, which was looking, so the, these ones here looked at clinician-patient communication. So doctor-patient, nurse-patient, allied health patient. What we did in the, what we realised during those projects is what was critical and even more of a problem in terms of patient safety was communication between clinicians in clinical handover. Um, so, what is clinical handover? Do, are all of you familiar with handover? There's, there's a few uh, doctors and nurses, very senior academic doctors and nurses here that are here, so obviously you are. But do, is everyone else familiar with handover? And what it is, is it's basically the transfer of professional responsibility and accountability for some or all aspects um, of a patient's care. There are 52 estimated, 52 million handovers a year in Australia, which is estimated, 300 million estimated in the States, 100 million in England, 15 in UK. And every one of these handovers represents a chance for miscommunication, okay? So each one of these, there's a potential risk to patient safety. And, but they, when I was talking before about um, the role of spoken language at work, we, People in a hospital context, they're very taken for granted routine activities, which is very typical of when everybody converses in a spoken language. They, that is just a taken, but they very rarely have the chance to stand back and see how's it being structured, how are we doing it, how does this impact on both our colleagues and, and the other patient. Okay, the, um, once again, the, the World Health Organization is labelled handover as one in the top three patient safety solutions. Once again, though, there is very little evidence-based research on why is it that these handover accidents occur. But you can see that if a patient <coughs> might have 14 different handovers in their journey, even more, 
If there's one bit of information left out at the beginning, the one that first handover, then if that's left out for the next one, then it can have repercussions. Okay, so I'll give you an example of a handover problem. This is a real example. So we called the patient Mandy, we changed the name, and she was admitted to a local hospital in Australia to give birth to a second child. She suffered from schizophrenia, but was, she was coping really well in the community. She had had a, a first child, she had no problems with the first child, and she was on antipsychotic medication um, called clozapine. Is that how you pronounce it? And, but when she fell pregnant, her psychiatrist um, provided a verbal and written handover to her GP, in which he described the significance of her condition, this is what's important, and the need for the monitoring of the medication. That was what was critical. It was known by psychiatrists that if you have suffered from psychosis, the first six weeks of, of, of having a child is particularly dangerous and vulnerable without the medication. So it has to be closely monitored. The GP then transferred her care to another colleague. He was away and couldn't be there. And that other colleague was responsible for basically coordinating and sharing Mandy's care with the obstetric unit. So when she went to hospital, the, 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 Mandy's, the, the information that the psychiatrist carefully handed on was not passed on by the colleague to the hospital. Okay? This meant that the clinical team didn't understand the significance of the medication. Mandy took the medication to hospital, but she didn't tell them, and even if, she, or even if she, they did know about it, which, was up, which in the coronial inquiry was uncertain, they did not store it or pay any attention to it. So contrary to hospital policy, Mandy stopped taking the medication, but the staff didn't realise this. She had a relapse of her mental illness, and then she was transferred to a mental health unit. Once again in the handover between the obstetric and mental health unit, the significance of her medication and condition weren't handed over. So, so she had her second child, the birth went well. She became, uh, which is not uncommon in the first six weeks, she became psychotic, ingested a corrosive substance, secluded, restrained, and then died in the intensive care, care unit for 10 days later. What the coronial um, inquiry found was it was accumulation of uh, oversights and communication, repeated failures to hand over accurate, relevant information, both spoken and written. No one got on the telephone to confirm, to, to, to speak to each other. It was these written notes that weren't very comprehensive. Okay, so, okay, so just very quickly before we go on to what we've done with the data and having a look at it, the, um, what, what, so, one, so, what, so what's happened? That people know the clinical handover has been a major cause of, 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 of many instances of death, but critical instances. So what, it, what they said was, okay, why doesn't handover happen at the bedside? So it was mandated by Gali, who Matt said that quote before about the uncivilised society, that handovers should take place as much as possible to include the patient. Now, it seems like a no-brainer from all of us, but I'm not being at all critical, because in hospital context, with the pressure to get those patients out of the ED, the pressure to get the patients from a ward because you've got people queuing up, etc. The senior doctor running and the junior doctor running behind them. The hierarchy is quite interesting. Then with me, the recorder running behind that. So you, <laughs> so you have these people running and then they don't have time. They'll just do the handover, but they won't. And so to be critical and say, you should slow down and involve the patient. That's the thing. I, I, we, we really stress with all the research, we're not being critical of the doctors or the patient or the nurses or the other clinicians at all. What they do is an extraordinary job. However, it is more and more proof that involving the patient ends up saving time in the long run. Because if, if you get it right and they don't have to come back to it for an, an avoidable readmission, you can imagine the amount of money that's saved, let alone lives and the satisfaction of the patient. So evidence shows, there's been a lot of evidence that patient involvement improves clinical outcomes. And that now we've got patient-centred care philosophy, which is the dominant one in Australia, in Hong Kong, where I've worked, UK, America. I think there'll be very few countries in the world where the health policy doesn't say patient-centred care. However, what's interesting, there's hardly any research that shows how communicative practice, how, how patient-centred care is manifested and embodied in communicative practices. In other words, it's okay to say it's patient-centred, but what does that mean in real terms, in terms of the way people, the clinicians communicate with each other or with the patients. 
Okay, the other thing is more and more patients are asking to be involved in their healthcare. Okay, so as you know, in the last 20 years, there's been a huge um, cultural change where patients expect to be involved. And in all of our interviews, there's not one patient who said that they weren't, didn't want to be involved in the handover. Okay, so what we did then, when we realised that the handover was issued, that was our, we, we, we then applied for another ARC linkage, and we got this large project um, across four states of Australia, looking at handover across four states. It was a wonderful project with a team of people across Australia, and that's when I managed to drag Susie back from um, whatever she was doing, but it wasn't. <laughs> and she then um, worked with me on the Canberra site, which I'm talking about today. But there was um, 2,000 hours. What we do with these projects, I'm gonna look very briefly now, is it is a particular kind of methodology where we interview, we do a cross Australia survey. Now we first of all did that purely cynically because we quantitative, qualitative research is virtually, it's still very hard to get qualitative research funded in the health world, particularly in HNMRC, ARC are a bit better with them. So we popped a survey in to have some numbers. However, after we did our first major, I mean, it is real, you do get very valuable data, but that's a compliment. So we are now less cynical about the mixed methods that we use, but we first of all did it in the beginning because no one understood. When we went to Hong Kong to the emergency department and I was talking to them about the project, it had just been approved by the health department in Hong Kong, the, the head of the ED said, we have research here all the time. He said, what's qualitative research? He didn't even know there was a concept of not doing it something which wasn't quantitative. And whereas he was extraordinary, over three years his attitude changed completely. So what we do is we um, interview, we then abs absorb ourselves in the context, so we observe for many, many hours. We, but th then the other thing we do though, is we actually follow patients through. So for the handover, for example, the most illuminating data was, for example, Dyslade goes into the emergency department. She's there for seven hours, then goes to a ward. Then she goes to another ward. Then she gets discharged. Recording their handover through that journey is, I think we got the best data that we've got anywhere. I mean, obviously we went home to bed, but we did stay there for most of the day. And we certainly saw the last formal handover, which once again, we would have missed the informal handovers. And that's where we did start getting indications of patient safety issues, where you could see the information morphed and changed as the, as the clinicians went in and out. Okay, so we've, we've got um, 829 actual handover interactions. But now I'm going to be looking for the rest of the talk at particularly, because that project was Western Australia, looked at um, metro metropolitan to urban hand, uh, sorry, um, regional to metropolitan handovers. South Australia looked at mental health handovers into professional. In, at ACT, we looked at nursing handovers and zoomed in on um, bedside handovers in New South Wales we looked at um, medical handovers. And we've got a great training program that I didn't do, but Jeanette McGregor did, where she works with senior doctors mentoring junior doctors in handover. Okay, so what we're gonna do is now look at the features of effective and ineffective handovers. I'll briefly look at the two hour training program and then look at the qualitative and, and quantitative aspects of the, evalu aspects of the evaluation. Now, the, with the translational research, some of you who saw Conversation Across the Creek would have seen this um, quite briefly. But what we do is we, after we do really quite a few weeks of the interviewing staff shadowing, we then audio and if possible video record. Uh, obviously quite, we, we've got 82 patients in the emergency department. We've got, as you said, 829 in the handover. It's an extremely labor intensive data collection because for those of you who aren't linguists, it takes 10 hours to transcribe one hour of talk. So you can imagine, let alone the analysis. So we do the analysis, then we analyze for discourse um, structures, for language features. What we do is very um, applicable linguistics. In other words, there is no point, and I'd love to know the clinician's view at the end, but there's no point doing a detailed Sorry, you can do the detailed analysis just for your own sake if you want to, you want to you know, develop a theoretical framework with this data, that's completely legitimate. But if you want to do it, which we did, to then translate it into making a difference, you need to really be selective about what you choose to look at. So we looked at to what in handover, to what degree do the um, incoming nurses clarify, challenge, question, 
Did they, what degree was the patient asked to contribute or responded to when they, etc. And we also looked at how the handover was structured. So you're selective in your linguistic analysis. In translational research, we came up with a definition, which I don't need to read out, but what it is, what's interesting, I'll come back to that in a moment, what's interesting is translational research, I didn't realise, but you would realise, you guys, in the medical world, it means something completely different to what we mean. What translational research means in the medical world, is that right? That's what is basically is called T1, which is the harnessing the knowledge from basic science to produce new drugs. So in a sense, there's a big gap between what we do, or the social science, if you like, view of translational research, and what is mainstream, which I didn't realise when we first started applying for grants in the medical world, but there is a big difference. But what T2 what M- M- research does which is our research, the typical translating research into practice. Because of the um, lack of clarification, we decided to come up with a definition, which we now, which we now use for all of our research papers, etc. So it's research that responds to real world health communication problems. It exploits the investigative concepts, expertise, tools and methodologies of different disciplines to produce practical outcomes. Okay, so so, we, so basically, we, the questions we're asking were the qualitative, which is predominantly, although it's mixed method, how do people collaborate largely through talk to get socially recognised tasks achieved? How might they do it better? What are the points of communicative vulnerability that increase or de- diminish risk? So what we found is, and what we, we think's really worked with training, but this is also with doctors, but that because what people focus on is the information, the transfer of information. Very few people who haven't stood back and had the opportunity to really think about how they're communicating realise that equally, if not more important, is the interactional issue. We call it interactional, not interpersonal, but as you know, it is the same. There's the interactional issues, but then there's also how was it structured in a systematic way. In the health world, They've done a lot of work on something called ISBAR, which is how to structure a handover. The problem is there's virtually no compliance with it, which is what because there's no training on it, and we're very little training, which we'll go and have a look at. But I'd love to hear these two senior um, clinicians give some feedback afterwards. Okay, but the point we keep making to them is the failure to achieve the interactional dimension seriously jeopardises the effectiveness of the informational dimension. Okay, just quickly, I think that you, I don't need to go through that. You can see that 40%, only 40% of the handovers weren't done at the bedside. And that's because they didn't want, they thought that the, um, they felt awkward doing it. And they were worried about confidentiality. So they'd often stand back. But the problem is, sometimes they'd be standing at Di Slade's bed while they moved on to someone else's. And they'd, so they'd still be talking about Di as they moved on. So there was issues there, but once again, it was um, done through lack of training. And Garling, I have to say, said, when he mandated handover at the bedside, he said it must be accompanied by full-scale training. He said, you can't expect a change of practice without this. Um, Okay, so that's the interactional problems that came up. So what we found was with the interactional, the two styles were exclusive versus inclusive, fairly obvious what that means, and the informational objectifying and agentive. Okay, so um, I'm aware of time, so I'll be quite quick. You can compare those styles of, and in the training, by the way, we use these, um, we use these authentic videos, and they've been one of the most powerful tools in terms of the evaluation. Okay, so uh, once again, the informational issues, ongoing nurses were often not prepared for the handover, which is a, they weren't given time to prepare. And the information was not presented in a systematic way, um, et cetera. Okay, so then we, well, we've, t- we've discussed that. So just to go on then to the delivery of the training, as I said, this is critical in terms of our translational research model. The, the, the problem is ARC linkage didn't used to, and I'd be, and I'd be interested to know if it's changing but they won't fund training. They'll fund the research, but I think now with the emphasis on impact, that may be shifting, but certainly up to a couple of years ago. Is it shifting now, Anne, do you know? So what we did, it certainly wasn't the case before. What we would do is we would do the training, develop a pilot, but we didn't have funding for that. So that was really, so what was wonderful about those DVDs 
I had this amazing um, person who rang me up and said, look, I gather you're looking for somebody to do admin work in the centre. And I said, you can't do that, Dash, you're the most wonderful filmmaker. She said, I need the money, I'll do it. And so when she started, I said, don't do, don't do the, I'll do the, can you do these? So she did them as part of her. That's, that's what, we're lucky enough to get it because it doesn't get funded. And that's what Susie Eggins and I are desperately trying to do now is race around Canberra to get funding to do some more. We, we might have some success. Okay, so we, what, what do we do? We develop the training materials based on the, the reenacted authentic videos. We delivered to 340 nurses, including Train the Trainer, which we've done. And then what we did, they heard us, somebody who was director of um, nursing at Hong Kong Sanitarium Hospital, heard Susie and I talk in Melbourne, and then found out I was in Hong Kong, got in contact, and really excitingly, we now developed um, bilingual, this here, I'm going to show them around, the bilingual materials in Cantonese and English. So we went in, but what we say is we don't do communication training, and, and simply. We don't just go in with a generic package. We say we'll go in and we'll record. So we recorded their handovers, and that was done at the tea room. And so we recorded the handovers and then developed the training, okay, which I'll show you. If, if anyone's interested, I can show you. But, um, okay, so we do a combination. There's only two hours, but what's exciting about it and it's not, it's not our, our brilliance, it's to do with the power of the authentic, is what I keep saying, is the videos. But also that, that they want to respond, they want to change their practice. It was, a, it was the most amazing atmosphere. So what we do though, we developed a protocol for the interactional dimension and then the informational dimension that's been developed across the world called ISBAR, which I'll show you. But what we did was we trained in it and added actual language examples to it. So what we did, the interactional, it was a really simple little acronym, connect, this is with the patient. What do you do, both with the patient and the nurses you're talking to, the dentist? Connect, ask, respond, empathise. It sounds really, really um, basic, but it has had a really, very, it's been really picked up on. The nurses now, I'll show you, they've got this little, this thing, and they actually wear it as part of a, at Hong Kong Sanitarium. So we've got one to how to um, use, it was called care team. So when you're doing the tea room handover, just communicating with the other, the, the outgoing team. So just the, just the nurses. Or one for the, what's called care, which is the, um, when you're involving the patient. So connect, greet the patient, introduce yourself, the team, blah, blah, find out what the patient knows, find out what your colleagues know. Once again, I know that it seems incredibly simple, but what it shows is what I started off by saying, which is that when you're talking, you very rarely stand back and think about how it sounds or what you're saying or impact on the listeners. So this is what this has done. It's just made, it just means they stand back and actually think about it. But we do give them actual language examples all the way through. So these are all authentic and there's, and there's a very um, high percentage of non-English speaking background clinicians across Australia and they find these, these role plays of actual examples very useful. ISBAR is how to structure information and it's used by the health department, introduce, situate, background. It's basically you introduce the patient, you then describe their current situation, you give background to the patient, then you assess the patient and then have the recommendation. ISBAR has been mandated across Australia for how many years now? Seven or eight. Would you say the compliance is very low or what do you think? We found with the nurses it was very low, and they said it was because there wasn't the training with it. So Suzuka is deputy dean, deputy dean or associate dean at the faculty, the, the school of medicine at ANU, um, and a wonderful specialist doctor. And a doctor, exactly, <laughs> and a fabulous communicator. And we're working very collaboratively with Suzuka on. Um, Okay, so that's an example of what you just said. It's the actual examples, and it's time to stand back and reflect. Times for the doctors to actually have that. But the thing we found the most the most pressing issue, and I'd be interested in your view, is that in a handover, it provides a perfect opportunity for a senior doctor to mentor a junior doctor, and <clears throat> and we found that that really happened. Is that um, so I've got a funny voice. So that, that, that actually <coughs> wasn't happening. So the senior doctor, on the whole, most of the ones we saw in the handover, but also in a hospital round, would um, 
give instructions, would talk, but very rarely would actually in, actively get say to the junior, what do you think should happen now? Why do you think that? The reason I'm just suggesting this is that. So, um, which is a very difficult role in terms of the role of the handover as a learning experience, as a mentoring. Okay, so what we did is we evaluated the training qualitatively and quantitatively. The qualitative um, <coughs> evaluations were very positive. Four months, we went back two weeks later, one month and four months later. And we're doing the same in Hong Kong with the fa fantastic Cantonese team just now recording the post-training. Um, and I have this wonderful research assistant in Hong Kong, Jackie, rings up saying, oh, it's really exciting. So but anyway, the, the nurses are handing over the bedside, not in the corridor. No one stood with their back to the patients. This was a change of practice. Outgoing nurses explicitly introduced the patients. Um, there was a lot more interaction, etc. particularly from the incoming nurses actually asking for clarification. Okay, and, and then that was the quantitative, which I don't need to go into. But what I'm going to do, I'll just play you one last video to before I men just mention the centre. Mm. Uh, we asked Diana and Susanna if they could help us educate because we had no way. We didn't know how to go about teaching the nurses about how to do the handover. So they came and filmed and they gave us some in-servicing. The important part that I got from it, nurses really didn't know what they were doing when they were handing over. I found a really a good session. I've learned stuff today. I'm an old nurse and a new midwife. It's really good to see how things have progressed and um, we can all learn to be better at um, giving hand over and keeping our patients safe. Having had this training will help me to go around and um, give some advice when I'm looking at people's doing the handover. I can now go out and be better equipped to encourage the staff to do it and to help them through it when they have questions. Okay, so just to finish off then, the um, we've also now about to go start at St Vincent's Hospital, which is really exciting. We've just got 100,000 from a Murdoch family trust and that's to do um, once again translational research and then if if they if that's successful that'll be rolled out across the hospital they, they, they're 12 hospitals and then we've um, hopefully we will do a medical handover they, they're expressing an interest but that's not committed yet and that's starting in about a month's time okay the um one just to finish off if everyone can have a look at what there was under their, their chairs the video i want to say this says that we've just set up an institute for communication and healthcare. And on that front, I just want to thank my colleagues in linguistics who have been absolutely incredible, really supportive, from Catherine to Jane to Susie, who am I leaving out? Everyone, Sharon, Katie, everyone's been amazingly supportive about this um, area of work, being in the department. And I can't, well, I mean, Susie's been involved in healthcare communication research for quite a few years and very was absolutely integral in me setting the centre up here. In fact, wrote the original first proposal, so more than integral. I couldn't have done it without it. So really I want to, and also the medical um, school, we're, we're talking to in detail with Stuka's uh, on the NHMRC grant. Joanna, sorry, I, <laughs> Joanna was even as so I'm looking around, um, but thank you. So anyway, so um, we have started it up, it's been approved. We're hoping to call it the, in, the International Institute, but we're talking about, we just need, need to get a name change. Because I, I, I set up a centre in Hong Kong with 90 members from around the world, many of whom are interested in joining this, but they care about it looking visibly international. So, and Paul, certainly Pickering, was very supportive of that and is speaking to working out what to do about it. But, um, but more importantly, so if anyone would like to join that centre, we would love to speak to any of us, Joanna and me, Susie. Susie and Joanna are also on our, my NHMRC grant. I put in 
which I think the chance of getting is a meal. But anyway, <laughs> that, was, that was worth all the work. Anyway, so there's the internet, and then there's a symposium here, which I would love you to be involved in. That's the launch of the centre is happening on February the 12th and 13th. If all of you could write in your diaries, February the 12th and 13th, I'd love you to be there. And it will be, look, it's very, we're only sending out this material next week. So, but we really hope to involve the fabulous partners in the health world. Just to say that what it makes, it's my last word, I promise, what makes the Institute and the predecessor, the International Research Centre, slightly different is it is absolutely committed to interdisciplinary research. So the, from the moment I first started talking to people here, the medical colleagues in the medical school, Imogen, who's the dean, and Chijuka, who's the deputy, were so supportive of the work. We couldn't, this work can only happen with an insider and outsider perspective. So what I think makes this centre unique is that it is truly collaborative. And we hope to involve other, um, like the public health section um, department here. And the statistical unit came up and said they were really keen they do some health work as well. So, and in fact, um, Terry Newman, her name is from the statistical units now on the NHMRC because I don't have a quantitative bone in my body. So she was, that was really wonderful that she expressed interest to be involved. Okay, so that symposium is happening and we'll send out more information. Okay, thanks.